Welcome to All About APIs. On this podcast, you'll hear from seasoned API practitioners, product leaders, and architects on what it takes to successfully design, launch, and maintain APIs that unlock new growth opportunities. Hello and welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the All About APIs podcast. I'm your host, Buddha, the product evangelist at Tyke. And over the course of the season, we have been covering topics associated with API-led product growth. And during that journey, we've explored a lot of different aspects, a lot of different elements of this specific part, this specific area of uh, API-first products. Today, we're going to be going deep diving into the world of API monetization. And joining me in that journey is the one and only Kin Lane. So hello and welcome, Kin. It's lovely. It's a pleasure. It's an honor to have you with me. Thank you for having me, Buddha. This is awesome. I'm so pleased to be here and helping you, you all with your podcast. Wonderful. So let's kick things off. Uh, perhaps a quick uh, introduction of all of the things that you've done, your fascinating journey, your fascinating career that you've had so far, your own got your own podcasts, you writing your books, you got the blogs around, uh, well, the API evangelist, which was, which was kind of an interesting one, because when I started off as an evangelist, uh, that was the first thing I searched and like, I wanted that name so bad. But anyway, let's let's mm. just talk about you. <laughs> a quick introduction, perhaps, uh, in into your world. Happy to. Uh, so I'm, uh, first of all, Ken Lane, I'm, I'm chief evangelist now at Postman. But yeah, I'm, I've been known as the API evangelist because I've had this blog since 2010. I think it's about 5,000 blog posts was the, my last count that I've written in a decade about APIs. And um, my what I did, what I did, be, was doing before API evangelist, I'm a database uh, expert. So I've been doing databases since the 1980s, just to date myself there a little bit. Um, but fast forward that I'm doing database driven web applications, service oriented architecture. I'm building websites using databases. And I saw APIs, the way APIs started being used in 2006 with Amazon Web Services and, and then 2008, nine with uh, the iPhone and delivering resources to mobile applications on iPhone and, and Android. And uh, and I was like, there's something here because I've been using APIs for a while, different shapes and sizes, but I saw uh, groups really starting to get organized. And it was right about that time that I saw kind of the the concept of API management uh, kind of codify in, in, in the way things were happening. And I saw companies getting more organized about how they do APIs and having deliberate business strategies around them. And I just wanted to understand it more and 12, 13 years later here, I'm still doing it. And uh, um, I've uh, helped a lot of enterprises with their their strategy. I've worked for federal government. I worked in Washington, D.C. for the Obama administration. I uh, did work for the European Commission on API standards across member states. And then found myself in 2019 joining Postman to, to kind of get a little bit more practical and, and hands-on in how I do APIs rather than just talking about them. So. Wonderful. That's been quite the journey. And um, following your work through the years has been absolutely amazing. The The blog posts were pretty much my, I think my first foray into evangelism started with your blog posts. And then looking forward into, I think when you started Breaking Changes as well, which is your podcast, and again, great conversations. We actually had, um, had, had Deepa as well joining us uh, for one of our conversations, which has been absolutely fascinating speaking with her. Um, so, so yeah, absolutely a big inspiration for myself and pretty certain people in the industry as well. So with that introduction, thank you so much for that. Um, just moving on to our topic for today, which again, given your background, looking at all of the different aspects and sort of the journey, the history of APIs, where we've been, where we are coming towards the evolution of how businesses are approaching or thinking about APIs, whether that is an API first approach to things or API led product growth, for instance, a big conversation topic these days is productizing and monetizing APIs. So, but in a lot of cases, there is an oversimplification that goes around that, which is API monetization is basically getting paid for your APIs. And how do we make that possible? So that's kind of a lot of the conversations tend to be driven by them. But obviously, when you get into the weeds with them and exactly what they're actually looking for, 
that is kind of far from reality in some cases where you know you don't have the basics in there but so i just wanted to get started with your thoughts and opinions into the world of api monetization what is it how do you view it and um, you know what are the different aspects of it yeah it's a it's an interesting realm to to dive into and there's there's so much nuance and detail to it and it's one of those things that you'll get 10 different answers about what is API monetization, depending on which 10 people you talk to in the space. And it's, it's what cap it's what I mentioned briefly, you know, with the API management providers, when I first started API evangelist is watching what mashery apogee three scale and the kind of the, the earlier guard of API management providers, they, they would give you this solution that said, Hey, you could publish a portal. You can publish your API docs there. You can have developers sign up and then you can charge them per API call. And, and there was very much this, you build it and they will come kind of mentality is like, hey, just put out an API. That's really cool. People are going to come build it, build build really cool things and you're going to be charging for that and you're just going to get rich. And that's how it's going to happen. And, it, you know, I believed it when it, when it, when it first, you know, I, I kind of... Uh, bought into the messaging and then you start realizing well there's so much more to actually doing an api than just the technical of an api or the the business of making it public and you mentioned it it, it there with product management there's a lot a lot of nuance to how you make you, you build these products what what makes an api product and a lot of people in the space because of API management vendor marketing um, really saying, hey, if, if you just publish your API publicly and you're charging for it, it's a product done. All right, let's, you know, on to the next thing. It's like, no, there's actually feedback loops involved. There's actually a uh, value exchange. Uh, there's there's a lot more to it than 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 just the API management vendor vision of it. And so when you ask people what it is, they they recite a lot of what what they've been told by vendors but once you've been watching it for a while you realize it it very much is about value exchange which sometimes there's there's money being exchanged as part of that that exchange but really it's about defining your digital resources and capabilities and now experiences putting it out there and then being able to actually understand that value that's being exchanged around that, like those consumers of that. So us as API pr producers are producing these experiences, these digital resources, we're putting them out there. Consumers are using them, but, and we're measuring that we have API management in place that, that, that tells us how many calls they're making, what they're using. We can even invoice and send them an invoice saying, Hey, here's how much of that you used we can charge different rates for different resources and different experiences for different partners. Hey, you, you get this for, for a hundred dollars, you get this for $50. And so we can, we can create different kind of financial experiences there, but it's not always just about the direct revenue. And it's not always about charging. I, I, I tell a lot of companies, they should just focus on understanding who's, who's using and, and measuring that value. And then, providing them an invoice of that value, but maybe you're not actually charging their their credit card with Stripe, but you are communicating that, hey, I did this for you, you access so much and it, and it has this value. And hey, let's have a conversation about maybe how we can iterate or evolve on this value and keep it more in alignment with your business goals. And that's really where I see the most important kind of API monetization activity happening right now around product management, those feedback loops, those iterations, and finding that alignment between not just develop, development and business, but the actual consumers of these digital resources. Absolutely. I think you're you're absolutely spot on in terms of, I think the, the thinking a lot of times is that you've got your APIs, let's design it, let's build it. And that is kind of the end of it. But Typically, even from our perspective, when we think about the API management, even within that cycle, we see that it's like, if you think about what would be useful for our API consumers, why, what is the purpose of actually having an API, then the design and the development of the API is probably like step one or two out of maybe a five or six step process. So you need to still think about, obviously, 
on a on a larger scale you need to think about the purpose and the value that it's going to be bringing but equally even from a more technical standpoint you need to start thinking about how do you how are you going to be securing those APIs or how are you going to be versioning it how are you going to be putting in those governances in place how are you going to be actually exposing them in a way that is easy to find easy to document or easy to search and then obviously adopt for creating their own products if you know you're sending it out to your API consumers so the the overall flow of value exchange and i think i think a lot of it is to do with a change in mindset where like you said the early days was really about um let's let's build apis because that is the new thing to be done and everyone is doing it why should not why shouldn't we be doing it and uh, it's it's a lot of that mindset which involves people's own people and process and obviously there's the product side of things so that that comes into uh, the whole equation so my my question again you obviously mentioned a little bit about with the value exchange spectrum of things and how that sort of goes in um if you if if organizations were to start thinking about it let's say today they are thinking about api monetization as um as a way to scale up their business or as the next iteration of their business what would you say would be a good first step for them to start thinking about it where right now they don't have anything in place they've got their core infrastructure in place they've got some value that they're providing with their product now they're looking to take out the take up the next step which is where you're looking at api led product growth they're looking at new launches perhaps or new um regions that it's going out to or maybe a new customer segment that's coming out to what would they benefit from having in their arsenal as well as what kind of mindset should they be going in with so this is this is an interesting one that i I've, i've recently changed my tune on and historically i've always said start small start with a uh, a side api a, a, a you know low hanging fruit something that's not going to cause too much damage if you make some mistakes or anything like that and wrap it in an api management solution get some reporting get some awareness on who's using it because if it's been in the shadow if it's an existing api it's been in the shadow of a mobile app you probably don't have that visibility and awareness into how people are using it so start there um and then look at your reports um get get to know how people are using it build relationships and connections with those 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 consumers and and then iterate from there now i'm changing my tune on that because i here here's kind of the narrative that i've heard play out several times is is we 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 launched an api portal we hung some apis in there we held some hackathons we got some people using it it was great um but really wasn't much business value generated and the program got cut program got axed we lost we lost a couple people because we didn't have the the business impact we needed and so now i'm i'm recommending that folks i don't say go big your first time out because you got a lot of learning to do as far as how to tune into those analytics uh build empathy with your consumers there's a lot of things that have to happen in this at this layer so you don't want to always just go big if if you can do it but right size it you know pick a project that will have some 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 business impact something you can point to and go look if we just did more of that then our business would be on on the right track and so that that monetization piece it has to be kind of right sized but but still pick a project that um isn't too ambitious that that is going to have room for you to learn get plugged into those analytics understand what's happening and be able to iterate and evolve and learn because that's really that muscle that you develop around that that iteration and those conversations and that your 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 API management dashboard the analytics is going to give you that's going to evolve over time and and the sooner you can build up those muscles the the better off you're going to be but you still need to come out of it being able to go hey this has real business impact this isn't just a hobby this isn't just a side thing it's it's not just this coupon api that no one actually cares about you've actually got to go go bigger than that absolutely right i think um it's it's that sort of balance that you need to meet right where you're not really while you're trying to start small but at, at the same time you're trying to provide enough value like you say to your api consumers that you know it's not so so simplistic where your mvp is is defined to be so simple that it's just just about works and in most cases people have kind of evolved today to say 
I don't think we need just about works. We want it to actually work for us and solve an actual challenge for us. And therefore, we are going to be adopting it. Uh, it doesn't have to be, like you say, massive, but it's going to be something uh, something that that is still meeting a specific job to be done in an organization. I think that's probably what the approach is in an organization, typically. Um, and if I think as a conversation with some of our, our sales teams, folks, and customer success teams, I think they are always emphasizing that how do we make take the conversation from, oh, this is fantastic and this is a great to have to a conversation where it is, we must have it now. And I think that transition is, I think that's, that's kind of the trick. That is a trick to success perhaps for an organization. Yes, yes. You have to, you have to be, it, it, and that's the thing with APIs is you want these baked into people's applications and integrations and you want them needing and depending on that because if it's a nice to have, there's not a lot of loyalty in this day and age. Um, you you touched upon another point there, where there is a lot of emphasis on just you know understanding how your product is being used. Obviously, if you are starting off in a in an appropriately sized manner, and you're trying to grow from there, an important aspect, like you mentioned, is going to be metrics. And I think we had this conversation previously in another of our episodes where we were really looking at metrics that matter. So when organizations or people are experimenting, perhaps with this, and they're getting started. What would you say are some of those metrics that they should be focusing on that is going to be that's something that they should be benchmarking and therefore leading them towards making the right decisions for their product? What would some of those metrics be? Yeah, so so early on, this is the the thing with the API management layer that I find fascinating is is if you take it for face value, you you plug in your you you stand up an API, you put an API gateway or management layer in front of it. And you have a set of kind of very technical metrics, number of API calls, uh, frequency, error rates, um, maybe a little bit on service composition, meaning they're in this usage plan, they're using these APIs. And, and so you have some very technical metrics, but that's very for people who are early on, you're, you're building digital resources, meaning you're putting out these resources, creating, reading, updating, deleting those, and you want to see who's using them and, and what what rates uh, they're using them and maybe charge them for those, those raw resources. But where I see people really progressing is they, they're not just built, they, they have a base buffet of digital resources, but they've now stitching those together into more meaningful business capabilities that actually accomplish a, a business goal. So for example, digital resources are products or orders where uh, a, a digital capability is your 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 product search, your shopping cart, and your ordering process. You know, so it's it's very much stitching together those resources into a capability for your business. And then the the third m mature kind of aspect of that is is your your building experiences. So this is like, oh, I just I found this this product on a Instagram and I one click bought purchase frictionless experience you know and it was it was smooth easy i got what i wanted and so how you provide re how you build in metrics into those experiences and to go from resources to capabilities to experiences and then measure and track and build awareness around what matters that that awareness building is really what your api management layer is for it's not just about authentication and security or reporting and analytics. It's about awareness building. So it's not the dashboard, it's you. It's what you learn from that dashboard over time watching. And then you can tweak and, and dial in your 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 metrics to be more meaningful. And here's here's an example of that is the the most common thing we say it, when it comes to onboarding new users is that time to first call. So Someone Googles, says, I need X, Y, or Z API. They discover, land on your API portal. They register. They sign up. They get a key. They're looking at your docs. They understand what's possible. They're able to make their first call. So that whole journey right there, you want that time to first call as, as short as possible. Because if I have to sign up and wait 48 hours, you probably lost my attention. You know, if I have to, there's a lot of things you can do in there. So that time to first call and reducing that's been a big focus point. But you had, uh, you mentioned Deepa earlier and Deepa 
when I did my podcast with Deepa, which resulted in me hiring Deepa and <laughs> bringing her onto my team, is um, is she mentioned time to first value. Okay, so it's not just time to first call. It's picking an API endpoint that represents value to producer and consumer. So this is, it's not just, oh, here's the first API call I, I, I'm making that I'm getting charged for. I guess that's a very simplistic way to look at value, but come up with some other other w- uh, part of this journey that, oh, I made my first call, but now I'm making the AP, the series of API calls that show it's integrated into my app. It's supplying my customers or my end users with what they need as part of my, my application experience. As a producer, come up with those ways of def- defining what those API calls are and then track that time to first value. How do I go time to first call, but rapidly go past it to, to generating business value and meeting those metrics that your product managers hopefully have set and, and are working towards as part of what they do. Given your background as well, working with standards and perhaps in the government space as well, I would imagine a lot of those conversations would come up where standardization as a mechanism for growth and not as a mechanism for inhibiting innovation is kind of the the idea. Now, how much that is executed or not, I'm, I'm, it's probably debatable, but I just wanted to get your thoughts on on standardization as well and the open API standards and open standards in general across maybe the financial services or just in general API consumption. What's your take around that? And, you know, what do you think is uh, maybe missing or maybe it is doing what it's meant to do? Yeah, I mean, standards are interesting because it's another one of those words that means different things to different people. And I have a much, I have a very... Uh, fluid definition of everything from internet standards and and I, IETF and you know HTTP is a standard like standards are good we should do this and then industry level standards you mentioned PSD2 and others um, fire specification for healthcare but then there's 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 a, a wide range of other types of standards open API and Swagger JSON schema standards are good but it's just standardizing is so important and in, and in, in what you're doing because mo- the sprawling digital landscape that has emerged over the last 20 years to support all the website activity, all the mobile app activity, every project to come along, integration partner, just every ad hoc thing to come our way. We have this sprawling landscape that isn't standardized at all or very rarely, but it has some standardized elements. We're using HTTP for a lot of it. That's that's a good start. Um, and so anywhere you can standardize is is so important. And Swagger Open API is an important first step. And a lot of people just purely see it as documentation. Oh, this is just so I can generate docs. Others will see it. This is just so I can generate code, SDKs, and I can auto-generate. I see open API as, hey, this is us getting on the same page. So when I say this path has, you know, three, uh, three properties and here's a schema that you're going to get returned. You know what I mean when I say that we're it's precise, it's, it's machine readable. It's, It's not always as precise as we would need it, but it's much more precise than we've been. And so just doing swagger open API to map your landscape, the sprawling landscape and standardize what you've already been doing so that we can see it because APIs are very hard to see. And this is what I think why API management is so important is because these APIs have emerged in the shadows behind our mobile applications and we don't see them. And so it makes standardizing in any way um, or steering in one in a direction or another or eliminating redundancy and being more efficient or being secure uh, much more difficult. If you can't see it, if you're not aware of it, uh, you can't you can't change it. You can't secure it. You're never going to be able to do any of those things. So standardizing for me is really just about getting on the same page and API management is really key to that because that's how you're going to, you're going to bring visibility to all these APIs. We're going to have a contract that between producer and consumer for each of these APIs, it's registered in the, in the gateway. 
Um, and now we're on the same page. We can start having a conversation at scale across many teams about what needs to happen. And we can have guidelines and standards for now what should we be doing to to further standardize, further stabilize this, this forward motion. And you're never going to be able to do it without standards. It's 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 kind of it's very interesting because if you think back about the philosophy behind why APIs came into existence uh, existence in the first place was really to have that universal language. It is the language of service to service, system to system communication. It is meant to be that standard language, but I think somewhere down the line, those those languages got fragmented by dialects, as we call it, perhaps in in terms of API styles, and you've got people who have their own variations of it, their own versions of it, because the initial definitions, while they were still better than no definition, I think they were a bit loosish, I would say. Uh, so it, it left a few things to uh, interpretation. And I think that's where some of that fragmentation came in and how people were implementing it wasn't standardized, therefore making it harder to integrate, harder to actually accomplish the communication that was that was. Uh, prophesized or promised with APIs, essentially. Um, it probably did the, did a good job communicating with their immediate systems, but I think more on a, on a global level where we're looking at inter-system communication, not just in t through a small set of services, but perhaps something that is that is a little bit larger than life. And, and that's kind of where um, we are getting to now with the standardized practices, where, uh, you know, obviously some of the open standards, like you say, the open API specification, great starting point, something that we have been really excited about here at Tyke 2. Uh, but even thinking about open banking and PSD2, of course, there is there is still room for improvement with some of that. But again, the philosophy behind it, which is something that I absolutely love about APIs when I think about technology, the philosophy behind why some of that stuff exists is always something that I find fascinating because we, when you think about standards, a lot of those, those standards were built because banking systems, if you wanted to integrate with any of the systems, everyone did their own thing. And to be able to hack as, as a fintech, perhaps coming in to provide some form of value to the consumers, if you had to integrate with a banking resource in some way, that would have meant pretty much trying to speak 10, 15 different languages to be able to actually communicate and bring something together and bringing that right value. With that standardization, the promise of that standardization there, the open standard, is that now you are, like you say, on the same page. And therefore, now that you've got the basics out of the way, your foundation stuff is done, you can start with your innovation journey and you can start with your growth uh, promise that you are really looking at. So with that, really quickly onto... Um, some of the examples that I'm quite curious about, because we've spoken about standards, we've spoken about you know how organizations can get started. I'm very curious now, given your years of experience in this field, what are some of the say organizations that you have that you have seen who have done this well? Maybe you don't have to name them, but what were they doing right? And on the flip side of that, organizations who got it horribly wrong, and what were they doing wrong? So one of the ones that that has been started doing it right is is uh the u.s department of uh, the u.s census bureau so this is the 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 federal agency in the united states that's in charge of counting the citizens and and, and creating the demographics and when i first started talking to them in 2011 they produce uh downloads of of their data so you can get the 2010 census as a massive download and and I said, hey, how, did you think about making that available as an API? And they're like, oh, no, no way we could do that. We just got to uh, make this available. We can't put our opinions on it. And, and API management would be us putting our opinions, locking it up. We got to just make it available and let people use it. And I'm like, well, it's a multi gigabyte download and it's pretty complicated. Not everyone has access to make sense of that and has the resources to do that. So you're immediately being opinionated and who can have access to it and who can't. So you're doing what you just said you didn't want to do by doing what you're doing. And then I'm like, do you know what Google's doing with your with uh, the flu information and tracking flu around the country? Are you aware of what Mail uh, not MailChimp, um, forget there, there was a data company out of Texas. Anyways, a data company, what they're doing with it. And I just rattled through New York Times is doing it. And they're like, no, no, we had no idea, no idea. And I'm like, you need an API management layer because then you would know who's accessing this data. And and they kind of begrudgingly launched one. And then they came back to me a year or two later. We, we launched a portal. And hey, you know what? 
we found whole new classes of users who just wanted a slice of the data. They didn't want the entire data set. They just wanted a, a certain slice, build a query, a section of it, have it in a spreadsheet and make, make uh, information. And you know what? These people were ones who were willing to talk to us and give us feedback, and they've proven to be so valuable. So these feedback loops have been established, and, and it's changing the way we're doing the census in the future and digitizing the census. So it's like, all right. Now we've connected um, a, an example of bad. Um, I have what I consider companies come to me and, and or institutions, companies ask me, where do we, where do we, we want to do APIs and where do we start? And I'm like, I guarantee you're already doing APIs. You're just not doing them with any strategy. You don't have a gateway or a management layer, so you don't have any visibility. And so I have th had this report that I would do called low hanging fruit. Here's the low hanging fruit. So what that meant is, is I crawled their website and I looked for every page that had a had a table over five rows, every spreadsheet, every CSV, every XML, JSON file, anything that was data in their website. I gathered that into a list and I would publish it to GitHub into a single readme. And I said, there's all and I organized it by type of resources like here's your digital resources. These should be hung in a gateway. You should have a management layer. And when you want to put it on the website, you you put it from there. If you want it in the mobile app, you you put it from there and you would have more visibility. And I did this for the um, University of, of Oklahoma. And I did it for a group in a, in, uh, a separate group. And they never got back to me after I did the report. And I was like, okay, whatever. And I moved on. And then about a month later, I get a call from their head of IT and said, we need to talk. And I said, oh, okay, great. This is uh, this is my job. And he's like, well, first we are gonna call the FBI on you. And I said, what? Why are you gonna call the FBI on me? And uh, and, he's, and he said, well, it looked like you hacked our systems and just did a dump onto, onto a GitHub repo. And I said, oh, no, I, I harvested all that. If I, you're, you're public, I just grabbed your domain and harvested every page and grabbed every URL. He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We figured that out. It took, a, it took us a couple weeks to figure it out. But apparently there's a whole bunch of spreadsheets with budget data, with PII, with all kinds of, and people were publishing spreadsheets to public locations, but they didn't feel it was public. And they were using that to share data and sensitive data. And so we've taken that down and, and thank you, you know, uh, for alerting us to this. And I'm like, well, you know what? had an API management strategy that probably wouldn't be a problem. You would have a little bit more control of your digital assets and resources and what people did. He was like, yeah, we're, we're going to work on that. We'll, we'll call you when we uh, need more help with that. So there's two examples of, of large institutions, I think that are, um, you know, applying API management or not applying in different ways and just really shows the, the, the value of doing it. Yeah. It's, it, it's so interesting because when, I so I'm I'm currently based out of India right now. I mean, not based out of, but I'm I'm in India right now. And I think obviously at the height of the pandemic, India being such a large large country, there was a lot of lot of things going on around COVID, and there was a lot of COVID data going in and out. And I think one of the one of the sort of positive examples that I definitely saw there was that all of that data, whether that is looking at what's going on in which part of the country and India is is a fairly large country with a whole lot of people so there is a lot of data that is going in and out and i think i thought they did a really really good job with that um the challenge however on the flip side of it i'm still going to stay with us and it's 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 about a lot of the government data is still siloed inside of pdf documents and i think that's the big challenge that how do we move that that significant amount of data which is which is truly significant. If you think about um, a billion in population, maybe I think we're at almost 1.5 billion now, where that's the kind of numbers we are talking about. And you need, obviously, you need scalability to even support something like that at, at a central level. But equally, there is all of the data that actually exists, but they are so siloed right now that trying to attain any kind of value, trying to extract any kind of value out of a PDF document is, is, is a is a thought that I do not want to think about late at night ever. So it is, it's a, it's a real but challenge. That data, there. that data probably right before that hit publishes PDF is probably in a database somewhere. Yeah. 
that could be exposed, but it's being published as a PDF. And then that's the distribution format. Exactly. And that's the distribution. And that's also that exp- that you're talking about the API strategy around the, how do you expose that information? Because there is always hesitation. And I think that brings me to sort of the next element, probably the last one for today, which is, which is risk management as well, where, you know, we obviously talk about growth and strategies around product led growth or API led product growth and innovation and transformation. But there is a big group of people for whom the risk management aspect of something like this, an endeavor like this is is critical. So in your experience then, how do you have conversations around that? How do you assure folks who are a little bit more risk averse, but also even if they are not, they are still gonna be analyzing and trying to scrutinize what's, what's going on and what's things going terribly wrong. So how do you sort of uh, work around that perhaps, or at least reassure them that this strategy is gonna do everything that it says in terms of the growth, but at the same time, we have got things in place so that you're not going to be losing out your entire business overnight. Yeah, this is, I mean, this is really the API game and it gives a lot of people a lot of anxiety because when I tell people, hey, you should be doing APIs, public APIs, it just freaks them out. They're like, oh, you mean we're going to be giving away, just make, putting all of our digital assets on the on the open internet for anyone to use? No, you're not. And so API management is very key to striking this balance between access and control. And to do business today, you have to let your digital assets outside of your firewall. I'm sorry. You have to allow people to access those those proprietary, those secret, safe, valuable assets that you you hoard or, or develop or build. And you're going to have to access other people's digital assets and resources to do business. So things are coming in out of your your firewall. So you can't hide from it. You can't, you have to be doing it. And the API gateway and then that management layer around it is how you balance that, that, that access and control and do it in a way that the right people are accessing what they should the right amount of resources they can only access so much a day of a specific area you can get very fine grain and control that so and then you have reports you can invoice them on that value exchange you can aggregate and summarize that and report to your leadership what's being seen and what's being done and so if you're not doing apis with an api management strategy you're being risky in your behavior, because these are all ad hoc, one-off situations to satisfy this partner request, that partner request, this mobile app. And if you do it with an, a, a strategy, you're able to balance and mitigate that risk. And it's 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 w- still walking the line. You're going to have this risk, but it's managed risk. It's a, it's a aware, uh, you're aware of it. You have muscles. Your teams are used to doing this. You can go from a private to a partner to a public API in minutes because your teams have the skills. They have the tools to do it. They're not freaking out and reinventing the wheel every time something's got to be exposed. They're they're used to it. And so APIs are how you you deal with risk in in today's digital business marketplace. Fantastic. I love the term. I think managed risk. I think that is probably the key term here where you're really, like you said, you are aware of the risks and you have put in a strategy for mitigation of those risks. And like you say, there's always going to be that fine line where there is always going to be some risk. It is, we see, I think based on a report that we have seen, there was what about a 686% increase in the overall API security attacks in just the last year. And I think that's just going to keep going on. The more we enter the API first world, there is going to be a greater emphasis in the world of API security and people need to think about that strategy. And I think the 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 worst part, not just the 686 as a number, as a 686% increase, but the, the worst number was that about a third of the folks who were interviewed during that survey they did not have an API management or security strategy at all, which is obviously, obviously, obviously not uh, desirable. So you, you're not really managing your risk and you're, like you say, making things a lot harder for yourself, not just for growth, but even for a basic infrastructure level. So with that, uh, thank you. That has been a fantastic conversation. Um, to bring this to a close, I would say maybe one final takeaway into the world of API monetization. If any, if people were to take 
anything away from this conversation, what would be that like final nugget that uh, you would say for people to pay attention to? One do that you must have in your arsenal uh, when it comes to thinking about API monetization. Oh, man. I mean, y- y- you just got to have something that, that gives you that visibility into that producer and consumer relationship. Because uh, if you if you don't have your finger on the pulse of what your consumers are needing and and be able to respond to that and build that in and and find your business alignment to that you're never going to be competitive you're never going to move forward everything that comes along is going to kind of derail your your business or or be seen as a threat so to be agile nimble flexible in in today's world you just you just got to have that 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 gateway layer with with a management view. You've got to have an aware, and you got to do that across not tens of APIs or just hundreds. I mean, it's thousands of APIs now. And if you can't do that at scale and see that, and and then make changes and see the value of of those changes you made across thousands of APIs with thousands of co- consumers, and respond and react in the moment each week you're you're gonna fall behind that's it if you don't have that that visibility you're you're in trouble fantastic so on that note i thank you so much kim that has been a fantastic conversation and uh thank you everyone who's been listening as well uh we were talking about api monetization and of course we are talking about api-led product growth and the different aspects of it during these different episodes so once again thank you so much kim it has been a fantastic honor to be having this conversation with you and uh, obviously on a personal load it's been fantastic learning so much about uh, the world of api monetization as well so once again thank you so much thank you so much for having me and thanks for tuning in you know where to find me if you want to chat again all right folks with that um Thank you so much for listening and until next time, cheers and take care. Thanks for listening to this episode of All About APIs, powered by Tyke, a leading cloud-native API management platform for the modern stack. So come, empower your teams and put your devs in the driver's seat. If you want to find out more, visit us at tyke.io. And until next time, take good care of yourself.